learning from Jesus about leadership. And um, one of the things that we're saying over, over and again is that all of us um, lead in some way. Leadership is influence. And so if you think about some of the people you have influence over or um, around, then you're exercising leadership when you're doing that. And particularly, um, there are many parents in this congregation, and um, we have influence. We're leading our children. Um, we might be leading and influencing those in the workplace or in the church or in many different ways. And there's so much to learn from Jesus. Um, and so that's what we're doing this, um, in this series. And um, just so you can kind of track where we're heading with this, we're, we're kind of following four, um, four themes. And the first one, which we did last week, is where we're saying, um, Jesus effectively was saying, I do, you watch. I'm going to... I'm going, to, I'm going to do it, come and follow me and watch what I'm doing. This, um, today we're looking at a little bit about um, uh, Jesus basically saying, I'm do, I do, you help. So I want you to start getting involved in what's going on. And then next week we'll be um, kind of moving to a slightly different place, which is you do it and um, I, you know, I'll help you. So that's next week. And then this one is you do it. And what is it? I watch, exactly. So do you see the, um, the way this works? And um, the, the way I remember this um, is um, thinking about a car. So um, when you drive a car, or when you're learning to drive, you basically, um, you just think, before you actually start, you think, this is the easiest thing anyone can drive. And that, that's basically what our children think at the moment. They're saying, yeah, it's easy, driving a car, no problem at all. So it's almost like unconscious incompetence. They don't know that they can't do it yet. But when they have a go and they start trying to do the gears and trying to bring the clutch out and push the accelerator and not break the whole thing, um, they realize that they are incompetent. They can't actually do it. So it's conscious incompetence. That's this bit here. They're consciously incompetent. And um, they have to work really hard through this second stage before they get to the third stage, which is conscious competence. That's where when you're driving a car, you just think about everything you're doing, but you, you're doing it. You're being relatively safe um, as long as nothing um, terrible happens. And you go through, you're consciously thinking about every single thing you do, conscious competence. And then once you've passed your test and you've been driving for a few years, you move into conscious, unconscious competence. You don't even think what you're doing. You can have a conversation with someone. You, can, you can't um, do on your phone. Um, <laughs> but you can do lots of things while you're driving without even thinking about it. Unconscious competence. And so when we move around these, in this process, what Jesus is doing and what any leader is doing as well, we can learn from Jesus with this, is that um, this is a process where we're equipping people to move from basically incompetence to competence. We're helping them to go from the first stage, unconscious incompetence. They didn't realize you know, what they were getting themselves into when Jesus first called them. But then they begin to realize, oh my goodness, this is actually quite challenging, um, but it's going to be worth it. Um, then they begin to start doing it themselves, thinking actually we're beginning to start praying for people and healing the sick and doing what Jesus did and he's helping. And then Jesus sends us and we um, get do it on our own. So does that make sense as to um, where this is heading, what this is about? So um, in a way, when we're looking at these passages about Jesus leading, we're saying, how did Jesus lead the disciples? Then we're looking at how does Jesus lead us? So we start applying that to ourselves. And then we take that application one stage further and we say, how are we going to lead others the way Jesus leads his disciples and leads us? Okay. So, um, this week we're looking at um, this second stage. I do, you help. And one of the things we see, if you just turn one page before, um, Matthew 14... On the left-hand page, you see Jesus feeding the 5,000. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. So, got this big crowd of people, 5,000 um, men, probably women and children as well. So, 15,000 maybe, something like that. And Jesus says to, uh, well, the disciples come up to Jesus. And in verse 15, they say, this is a remote place, Jesus. It's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And then Jesus replies, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they say, 
we've only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. In other words, you're barking mad. This is, you know, this is all we've got. How can we feed all these people? And Jesus says, bring them here. And then he gets them to sit in groups. And then as he begins to break the bread, he gives it to the disciples. And the disciples helping Jesus begin to feed the crowd. Jesus does it and they help. Amazing. Jesus invites us to get involved in his work. He invites us to, to get into, the, into that amazing call. When Jesus said, we looked at last week, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. Come and join in with building the rule and reign of God. What an amazing privilege that is for us. But just, literally just a couple of pages later, a couple of, not much later, in um, chapter 16 that we're looking at now, um, there is almost a, a, a change in tone. Things are getting a little bit difficult. And um, you might be able to relate to this. So, you know, as I was kind of thinking about this, I was thinking that you know, that first stage is about vision, it's about excitement, it's um, everything's happening, we're joining in with it, and it's wonderful. And there are lots of things that we start in life, which uh, we, we start for very good reasons. We think, yeah, this is the most amazing thing. And then the next stage, we just think, help. This is slightly more difficult. So, for example, um, you might have come back to God as a Christian, and um, it's amazing but you're just beginning to feel actually you're in the middle of a desert and it feels like everything is hard work as a Christian. You're being challenged in, in every way. It feels dry and it feels like being in a desert. You feel that God hasn't spoken to you for ages and ages and yet you know it to be true. It's hard. It's hard going. Perhaps um, you've started a course um, in a university or, or wherever and the pressure of um, juggling the myriad responsibilities you already have is overwhelming. You've got to that stage where it seemed like a good idea before, but now, help, it's hard going. Perhaps you've had another baby and the exhaustion is just beginning to hit you. It seemed like a great idea. <laughs> But it's just challenging. It's challenging your own, you know, everything about you is just thinking, this is so hard. Um, your marriage is under strain because it's so hard. This is the reality of the second stage of, um, of, of discipleship and of leadership. Perhaps you have a new role at work that um, sounded great, <laughs> but it's proving a little bit more challenging than uh, it, um, that you ever imagined it to me. Uh, perhaps you're leading a connect group or a small group or some part of a ministry here in church. And it was just wonderful. The, the leader sold it to you in an amazing way. You'll be amazing. It's going to be great. It's going to be the best thing. And actually, it, was, it is, but it's just a little bit difficult because no one's turned up to help. And it's you know, a little bit more, um, I've been given someone else's role as well. And it's quite hard going. Does that sound familiar, any of those things? <laughs> yeah. We all have it. This is the second stage of a life process that we go through again and again and again. And it's important to um, recognize it and know what's going on. So um, effectively, if you're enthusiastic here, you're unenthusiastic here. You're unenthusiastic. How do we, um, how do we deal with being unenthusiastic or unmotivated or finding it difficult when hardship really hits? How do we deal with that? That's what Jesus is speaking to um, in, this, um, in um, these words, these verses. So the first thing I want to draw out is that Jesus encourages us to count the cost. If you imagine a, um, a graph and... This top bit is when things are going well, and this bottom bit is when things aren't going so well. And we know that, you know, it's like this, isn't it? And the question is, at this point, is it going to do that or that? We just don't know. 
We don't know the future if that's time. Counting the cost. Jesus says, from that time on, well, the, the right that Matthew says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So what's going on here? What well, Jesus has called his disciples, come follow me, come and be part of building the kingdom of God. And it's amazing. The disciples are following. He's been doing miracles. He's been getting them involved in it. And it's exciting. It is exciting seeing the kingdom of God growing and impacting people's lives. But then opposition begins to emerge. We see um, the uh, jealousy and challenge from religious leaders. So um, just in the earlier on in the chapter, we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees testing Jesus and by, um, by association testing the disciples. Um, the Roman authorities are threatened by this new religious movement. So John the Baptist has been beheaded. He's been executed by the ruler at the time. And the disciples are beginning to feel it's getting tough. They realize who they're following. So just that passage before, um, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, Jesus, Jesus says to them, do you know who I am? What, who do other people say I am? And who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. You are the God's chosen king. And there must have been a, a bit of excitement and a bit of trepidation at that point. Excitement because, wow, God's turned up and, he, and we're involved. But then everyone's out to get him and we're involved. What does Jesus do? Things are beginning to get overwhelming. Does Jesus say, do you know something that's going to be fine? They're there, don't worry about it, everything's fine. Actually, we don't see that. We see Jesus saying the opposite, almost. He says he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the Lord, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. So he says, you know, is it going to be okay? No, actually it's not going to be okay. Um, I'm going to get imprisoned and I'm going to get murdered and um, I'm going to be raised to life you, that, again after three days. You don't know, understand what that means, but that's fine. Um, and if you think, basically he's saying, if you think it's getting difficult, you haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get more difficult. Jesus is saying, there is a reality to following me. It is worth following me, but there is a reality of following me you need to count the cost. I think it's interesting that he doesn't say count the cost before you start. He invites people to follow him and say, this is amazing, it's going to be amazing. And then once people recognize that it's amazing, he then says, this is how difficult it's going to be. And he does that once they've recognized who they're following. Once there's a reality check, we're following Jesus, the Son of God. Then he says, it's gonna get really difficult. It's gonna be very challenging. And I think there, is, uh, there comes a point in leadership, there comes a point in discipleship as we recognize um, what we've got ourselves into. But as leaders, as we're encouraging others that we need to tell it as it is. We need to say, do you know something? It is hard and it's going to be hard. Um, Garibaldi was a freedom fighter in the mid-19th century in Italy. And he um, was trying to... Uh, unite the people of Italy against the Austrians and the French who'd invaded um, and who were fighting over um, Italy. And um, with 1,000 volunteers, he conquered Sicily and just began to move up the, uh, the boot of Italy. And um, in, nine, in 1849, Garibaldi was um, surrounding with his um, volunteers Rome and uh, sieging that city. And he said this to um, the people who were with him. I offer neither pay nor quarters, nor provisions. I offer hunger, thirst, forced marches, battles, and death. Let him who loves his country in his heart, and not with his lips only, follow me. If you're struggling yourself, or if you're helping someone who is struggling, 
the best thing to do is to acknowledge that difficulty head on. Face the difficulty, count the cost. It's an important thing to do, to say, do you know something? It is hard, it's going to get harder. You need to know the reality of what you're, you're embarking on. But it's worth it. Notice what Jesus is doing here. So from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples. One of the things in this stage, the second stage, is that rather than just being clear about where we're going, Jesus is still clear about where we're going, but he's now beginning to spend much more time with the disciples, encouraging them, and spending time with them, answering their questions, explaining things, going into detail about the things they don't understand. He's spending time with them. In this stage of leadership, this is about coaching. This is about coming alongside and helping people to keep going um, through this challenging part. We need to recognize that that is an important stage um, of, of what's going on. And um, he, you know, I was just saying to, um, uh, before we, we started the 9.30 service, but one of the things that we need to be careful of is that, you know, you can spend all your time proclaiming this is where we're going, and if, if you don't spend that time with people, if you don't get close to the people you're encouraging, you have too much distance between you. You need to be really careful about that. And I came across this quote that says, when a general gets too far ahead of his troops, he often gets mistaken for the enemy. And there's some wisdom there, isn't there? You can, get, you can be so far ahead of people in leading others that actually they're not following you. They're, there's a little bit of a distance. And we need to actually make sure that that distance is closed by encouraging people, particularly when it's difficult. Otherwise, you might get shot at and isolated. So we don't want that. So the first thing is counting the cost. A very important stage in, in, in your own struggle or perhaps as you are with others who are struggling. How can you help them to recognize actually the challenge? Perhaps so they're not surprised by what lies ahead. That's the first thing we see Jesus doing. Second thing we see Jesus doing is um, uh, inviting challenge, really. Um, this is a really upbeat talk because it's, <laughs> it's hard sometimes life is hard so inviting challenge and let's just see what happens next in the story Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him never Lord this is about going to his death never Lord this shall never happen to you and Jesus turned and said to Peter get behind me Satan you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, I don't know what that felt like for Peter. Peter, just a few moments before, has just been top of the, top of the class. He's the one who's just said, um, who do people say, um, you're the Messiah? And Jesus says, yes, yes, you've got it right. Top of the class, here's the, here's the gold sticker, here's the award, here's the certificate. You've done it. You are the first to acknowledge and recognize who I am. And Peter, we kind of get the impression from the scriptures, he's proud of the, you know, what he's achieved and he kind of um, has big feet, isn't he? He kind of steps into um, holes that are just waiting for him to swallow him up. And here's this next stage where he says, no, Jesus, we're not going to um, allow this, this um, difficulty to happen. And, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. That must have been so um, devastating for him to, um, not just to hear that, but to process it, to recognize you know, that um, he was going in line with what the, um, the devil wanted, to take Jesus away from um, what, he was, uh, what was, he was called to do. We need to recognize that the second stage of a discipleship process um, is the easiest place to give up. And people will try and resist um, difficulty. We're, we're made like that as human beings, aren't we? We want to find the easy way out. And we need to keep 
going. The most difficult, remember that square, the most difficult part to turn around is that, is that bottom left-hand corner, oh, sorry, bottom right-hand corner. Um, moving through that, you know, conscious incompetence and moving towards conscious competence. Um, just getting to that place where things begin to start getting easier. And the, because it's a stage which, where many people just give up, actually, the, it's very important for people to hear guidance. We, if we're struggling, we need to hear that guidance and that encouragement, um, that rebuke if necessary. And if we're leading others, we need to be those who will give that guidance and give that challenge and give that rebuke. If you don't, people will never learn. They'll, they'll, they'll just always give up. And I have to say, with, with parents, you know, this is something we must not shy away from. We must not shy away from challenging our children. In leadership in the church, you must not shy away from challenging those you're leading. Of course, we need to do that in a compassionate way, in a gracious way. But we mustn't stop challenging. We mustn't create a situation where there's no boundary for our children, where they, they just don't know where they're going. They don't know what the boundary line is. So if I was um, drawing a picture of this, it would be um, you know, a person like this who... So, you know, like this, but there's a sign that says wrong way. That is the wrong way. Don't go in it. And they might not be very happy about it, but it's we have to say, we have to put the boundaries in place and say, no, that's not right, or that's a step too far, or no, that's taking us off where we need to be going. We need to be heading, even if it's difficult, in the right direction. So um, it's important, though, when we do that, to have the right perspective when we're encouraging others. Um, uh, Andrew Carnegie um, was, at one stage, one of the wealthiest um, people, I think the wealthiest person in America, who's a multi, multi-millionaire. And um, he came from Scotland originally, and as a child, he moved to America. And he did a variety of jobs, and he ended up um, leading one of the most successful steel manufacturing companies in, in America. And he um, had, at one stage, 43 millionaires who were working for him. And millionaires in, in those days, um, to be a millionaire then was the equivalent of having about $20 million to, in today's terms. So, he, you know, 43 millionaire, uh, multi-millionaires basically working for him. And this reporter asked him some questions about, um, about how things are going. And the first question he asked is, how come you've got um, 43 millionaires working for you? And the first, he said, actually, they weren't millionaires when they, when they started. They became millionaires as they were working for me. And the second thing he said was, how did you develop these people to be so valuable to you? And he said this, people are developed in the same way that gold is mined. When you're mining for gold, for every ounce of gold, you need to move several tons of earth and dirt just to get that ounce of gold. But when you're mining for gold, you don't focus on the dirt. You're not mining dirt. You're focusing on the gold. And when we're leading others, when we're challenging them, when we're encouraging them to, to keep going, we're not focusing on the bad stuff that's happening. We're focusing on all the potential of that gold. What, all the good things that um, are in that person. In our encouragement of others, with our children, with those we're leading, with those around us, look for the gold. Don't focus on the dirt. Look for the gold as we challenge um, and encourage those we're leading. Like everything else, the more good qualities that we look for, the more good qualities we'll find. Inviting challenge. And thirdly, we see Jesus encouraging us to persevere. Look at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me 
will find it. What good will it be for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward everyone according to what they've done. Truly, I tell you, some are standing here, um, will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So this is about learning to persevere. Learning to persevere. And so it might be um, a, uh, a runner. keeping on going but it's quite difficult and um, it's a long and winding road to the finish learning to persevere so this is the full account of, do you remember what Jesus saying at the beginning um, when he calls the disciples, he says, come follow me. That's all he says. But he's doing the same thing here in verse 24. He's saying, follow me, but with a few extra, um, uh, extras here. He says, um, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow me. And so um, it sounds a little different. This is the reality how many of us have got into something without realizing the full um, implications? And yet, often when, we're, when we've been through difficulty and we look back at all those challenges to where we are now, actually many of us will say, actually, I wouldn't change that. Even though it's been hard, the place I'm in now is so much better than it was before. That's because we've persevered. That's because we've kept on going. That's because we've kept on saying, I, this is worth it. I'm going to keep going in spite of how difficult and painful and uh, the suffering involved. I'm going to keep going. Perseverance is the most difficult and challenging lesson I think we have to face. But it's also one of the most rewarding. Um, Remembrance Sunday is all about recognizing that people have faced the challenge and have persevered in spite of the cost. You know, when you actually read through the history of battles and wars, there was extreme cost involved in achieving a goal. Many mistakes were made. But would we change where we are now? Would we have rather have not gone through that in order to be where we are now? We've got so much freedom because of what these people have done. As we lead others, we need to encourage them and support them and um, uh, help them to keep running, to keep persevering, to keep going, and we need to cheer them on. I love the story, I've told you this before, about sandhill cranes. Sandhill cranes um, are large birds that fly great distances um, uh, across continents. And they have three um, remarkable qualities as they're flying. Um, no one bird stays out in front all the time. They rotate their, um, the, the lead birds. Um, secondly, they can handle turbulence, um, but uh, they handle it together. Um, so they, the way they, um, they are f formed in formation, they help each other to, um, to go through um, very difficult turbulent conditions. And the third thing is that when one bird is leading, all the others are honking. So they make a racket because they go honk, 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 honk as they're flying through the air, these sandal cranes. They, those others are encouraging the lead bird to keep going. 
And then that one um, uh, takes uh, another place and another bird goes in front and they're honking encouragement, honk, 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 keep going, keep going across vast distances. I don't think that's a bad model for us as we think about leadership ourselves and as we want to um, encourage others um, uh, as they lead us. You know, we need to be able to handle turbulence. We need to be aware that leadership is shared. But we need perhaps most of all to recognize that um, we all need to have honking behind us (laughs) to keep going. (laughs) Honking encouragement. In this second stage of discipleship, if we seek to short circuit this stage, then we will miss out on the chance to grow. We'll miss out on the chance to, um, to uh, gain vital experience in our lives and in our own discipleship and our, our leadership. And we miss out on the chance to learn from God. It's often in the most difficult times that we discover the grace and the provision and the love of God in a much deeper and more profound way. If we dare to go through challenge and difficulty, we will come out the other side with um, a confidence that's based on experience and we'll have an enthusiasm that's based on a greater and deeper understanding. And that experience, that understanding, leaves us better equipped to face challenges as they come towards us. We're able to handle that more easily because we've been there before. And that happens in every sphere of leadership. We know that with parenting. The second, lots of things are easier. Some things are more difficult. A lot of things are more difficult. But some things are easier because we've done it before. And then when we push through that, we'll be ready for the rewards of the third stage, which we'll talk about next week. I just want to finish with a um, a quotation or just a, a you know a, a, an encouragement from um, a, a man called Bruce Larson. He writes this about leaders. The world needs leaders who cannot be bought whose word is their promise, who put character above wealth, who possess opinions and a will, who are larger than their vocations, who do not hesitate to take chances, who will not lose their individuality in a crowd, who will be honest in small things as well as in great things, who will make no compromise with wrong whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires, who will not say they do it because everyone else does it, who are true to their friends through good report and evil report, in adversity as well as in prosperity, who do not believe that shrewdness, cunning and hard-heartedness are the best qualities of winning success, who are not ashamed or afraid to stand for the truth when it is unpopular, who can say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. Jesus calls us in our discipleship, but also as we take a step back and help others in their discipleship to count the cost, to invite challenge and go with it and to persevere, to learn to persevere, to learn to keep going. Would you like to stand and let's pray together.